you may say, what does a salvage guy have to do with safety and uh, best practices and things like that? Well, I think we have a lot to do with it. Because when we show up to the scene, something has gone wrong with all the stuff that the gentlemen so far before me have discussed. The system breaks down. And the system, by design, is supposed to break down. What I'm going to talk to you about is what I think is the ultimate best practice is to have a safety net at the end of the system. Okay? Hopefully it'll make some sense. We're all in business to be successful. I think you heard that today. We're there to do the right thing, be socially responsible, be profitable. That's what it's all about. Sustainability, resiliency, and continuity are three things that we look after in our company, in our little salvage company based out of Houston. It's very important to us to be able to sustain, be resilient, be able to, when something bad happens, get up and go, just like Carnival Cruise Lines is doing after the Costa. And to have business continuity so that you can be profitable, okay? That should be the context. That's what all of us should do at home and at business. We're designed to make mistakes. I don't know how many Catholics we have here. Greeks are very religious. I'm very Catholic. That's why we have confession, right? Because we sin and we go to ask for forgiveness. We're designed to make mistakes. Look how many years have elapsed. Mariners with a lot of experience, highly trained. These were not third world seagoing seafarers. As a result, as Mr. Franzen said, reactive regulations. Solas, OPA 90, and something will come out of Costa Concordia, for sure. And the vessel in New Zealand, for sure. We need to be proactive, as he said, absolutely. So we cannot control the human element, right? We're designed to fail. We're not perfect. We make mistakes. We are human. 65 to 70 percent of all maritime casualties are caused by human error of some sort. The other element we cannot control is nature. Hurricanes, storms, typhoons, floods, lightning. A lot of ship explosions are caused by lightning. We cannot control those. So we have to develop within our companies without our, our in, internal structures a culture of acceptance that these actions are going are to happen. And the KPIs and the checklists and the CDIs and the sires and the regs are probably inadequate to really fill in the holes. Okay? If you get into a comfort zone that all these other things are not going to are going to protect you, you, we're in trouble. So casualties equals regulations. Francis, Mr. Francis' uh, slide there led nicely into what I have here, right? Casualty in Alaska, the one in, in the bottom, many of you probably were too young to remember, and of course the Exxon Valdez also in Alaska. I call regulations a Band-Aid. Honestly, I really, really believe that regulations are overcooked. I think it's time to deregulate. So, best practices. You know, here's a seat belts, you know. I remember the days growing up in Peru when people took, sorry ladies. Uh, it could be the other, could, women drive too, so it could be the other way around. <laughs> when people used to take the seat belts out of the car because it was a pain to have a seat belt. People used to take the seat belt out of the car. How long has it taken for us to not put our seat belt? Now, do you put the seatbelt on because it's the law? Or do you do it because it's the right thing? You can answer that question to yourself. Some places in the US, they do it because it's the law. I can tell you that at home, it's an automatic now. I get on and do it, and I don't think about the police anymore. Now, how long has that taken? How many generations? Because I remember my father and my grandfather taking the seatbelts off the car. Simple application, but this is where we need to get to with shipping. So, safety regulations, are they then in a, in a way smothering best practices? Are we overloading the system to a point where those practices that we know are the right things, we know the lookout is the best practice, we know getting on the bridge wing is the best practice, but are the regulations and procedures preventing us
from doing the right thing. And as the young mariners come up, and as you young people in the audience get involved in shipping, how are those guys going to learn what the right thing is when there is no time to do it? So this is my little model. I didn't steal this from anybody. I'm proud to say I developed this little model. Then I think uh, this is what I call the overloaded BMT, the bridge management team, and the SMT, the shoreside management team. Right? So in one corner we have, the, on the green side, financial stress. Well, maritime crisis, freight rates are down, so on and so forth. Right? That leads to potentially operational shortcuts. On the blue, right, experience gaps. We have a new generation of seafarers. The old generation of seafarers that used to know how to use a sextant in a paper chart is leaving. Every day, they're going away. And we're getting into the electronics. My daughter is a navigator. She could not, she can barely use a, a paper chart. That will lead to poor decisions at some point. We have a society, as you saw the event in Dhaka, that's very aware. Twitter, Facebook, YouTube. That leads to unachievable expectations from society and from government that put pressure on those two teams, right? And at the end, we have reactive over-regulation. Too much regulation. What does that lead us to? To a false sense of security. We believe, and Port State Control believes, and IMO believes, Oh, we regulated this now, we should be okay. It should be okay. And you, because you comply and you check the list off and you pass the SIRE vetting, you must be okay. That's what we have. This is how I see, this is I-5 in California. This is what I see that our safety processes in shipping. I'm on the, I'm on the end, remember, I'm on the end of the chain. I'm at the end when everything goes bad. And I see the US Coast Guard, and I see the California state, and I see Alaska state, and the EPA, and IMO, and on, and on, and on, and on, driving in their own lane, trying to do the right thing, right? And what we should be doing is we should be put all those people in one bus, put somebody to drive it, and head for the right, they all want to do the right thing. We all want to do the right thing. Nobody wants to have an accident. Nobody wants to pollute, right? Nobody wants to kill any crew members. That's what we need to do. How we get there, that's the million dollar question, answer. So I, uh, and I've given this, this a similar presentation before. I've given it to the head of IMO, right in the audience. And I said, gentlemen, you guys are doing it all wrong. And I don't own ships, so I'm okay. You know, I can say these things. What we really need to do is to provide an oversight system. It should be a safety over a oversight system that allows for self-regulation and self-policing. Okay? And it should be part of an overall global policy. There's way too much, way too much. And at the end, it all ends up on the bridge with the poor captain. So, this is, now we get into my best practice, the double bike. Safety is great, but safety is on the front end, right? Preventive. I'm safe, I'm never going to have an accident. Well, what if you have an accident? Well, you better have a response system. You better know how to get up from that bike and get back on the bike and keep on pedaling or fix the tire. To me, that is key to any of these ship management programs, any of the safety programs we have in place. You need to accept that you're going to have a bad one and have a system and a procedure to get up and continue operations, okay? And I see that that takes a lot of vision and it takes a lot of leadership. You know, if I was the CEO of a company, I had to answer to stockholders and say, sooner or later, we're gonna have a major casualty, we're gonna have a major pollution, they'll probably fire me. So that takes a lot of guts to do that. But I'll tell you what, if you're able to get past that and develop a policy that really gives you that resiliency as a company, you'll get there. Safety net, emergency response services, that's what we do. We believe, I believe, that we are a safety net. When all goes wrong, you should have that safety net. You are not emergency responders. If you were emergency responders and you were responding to groundings and explosions every week, you should probably get out of business in shipping. You should probably look for something else. But you need to have a relationship that gives you that safety net, okay? New regulations came out yesterday. 
OPA 90, the non-tank vessel response plan, another regulation. But if you look at the right, at the right angle of this regulation, okay, it does provide a safety net. It's been difficult for the tanker industry, but now when you look at what the tanker industry is doing and how they have benefited because they have established relationship with their safety nets in the US. There's a system that you press a button and the responder goes out. Pre-agreed contracts, pre-agreed tariffs, which de delays are kept to a minimum. Business disruption is kept to a minimum. It works. So if you look at this particular regulation, there is an angle, there's a spin to it, that you could say, hey, this may not be bad. The tip of the day, don't have a casualty in U.S. waters. If you have a casualty in U.S. waters, don't have it in Alaska or California, right? Come down to Houston, we're okay, we don't, oil, we like oil, so a little oil in the water is not so bad. <laughs> but this is how casualties are administered in the U.S. Three, four hundred people in a room being fed information that is getting distributed, okay? And maybe the guys really having an impact on what's happening are three or four guys on the bridge of the ship. This is the monster. So, but it's part of doing business. It's a new, complete new culture of casualty response in the US. I believe in this support model. This is what we sell to our clients. We're here to help you comply, to help you respond, and to mitigate your losses and get you back to business as soon as we can. That's what we try to do. You need to be, if, we, if you're not in business, we're out of business, right? So the old model of us waiting for the big casualty and make a retirement in one go doesn't work. I'm the oldest guy in the company. So we're a young company, and this is what we believe in. Awareness and avoidance. Be aware that it can happen and try to avoid it. All right? So integrated safety and response. I don't know if that makes sense to you guys, but if it does, take, take, run with it and implement it into your programs. Uh, we all have our preferred doctors and preferred mechanics. Have a preferred responder, somebody you trust in a moment of urgency. If you, have, you know, makes sense, right? We do it every day. So, a few questions. Those of you in shipping, are you truly committed to being successful in business? Do you have a sustainable framework? Can you go through a Costa Concordia type event? Are you truly committed to safety? Or are you just there to make charters and port state control happy? Right? See, I have the benefit of saying all that because I don't own any ships. Best, best practice. Create an environment. Some of you have seen this slide already in some of my OPA 90 presentations. But really, this is the key. Create an environment throughout, top to bottom in the organization, from the managing director, from the owner, all the way down, that allows for this recognition of a problem, just like an x-ray. Try to find that problem before you have to get drilled by the Coast Guard or by your charters or by a lawyer, okay? I hope, uh, keep your eyes on the road and off the screen, that's where all the young mariners are here, you know? get that, those computers in the water. But uh, I hope this uh, made some sense to you. It's, uh, it, makes, it made some sense to me. Postulus is laughing, so it's good. Uh, one note I wanted to make, and I don't know how you plan this, but if you, if you look at all of us, we kind of look like similar, huh? We're all, except for Rod, short, bold, and with glasses. <laughs> but, <laughs> Did you pick this or what? You must have picked this. Terrible. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He's the big guy, the good-looking guy with hair. Anyway, thank you very much. That's all I have. Thank you.